how important it is to have a firm foundation for our daily Christian life. For without a foundation, we cannot live for the one who saved us. It all has to be done upon what Christ has done for us. Take your Bible and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 5, please. Deuteronomy chapter 5. The sermon this morning is uh, Beholding the Word. And uh, Word in two aspects. We have Christ who is uh, the living Word, and we have the Scripture, who, which is the written Word. We know that God became flesh, and we are to behold Him. In John 1.14, the Bible says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is God the Son incarnate. He is the Word come in the flesh. And if, we, if, we, if you remember early in the Gospels, in John 1.45, we have Philip saying, rather Philip finding Nathaniel and saying, Unto him we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So the Lord Jesus Christ is the Word, and we have to behold him. We have to look at him and look to him for our leading, for our direction, and for our deliverance. We also have to look to the inscripturated Word. We have to behold the Word of God. Hokiah, the priest, in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 8, says, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hokiah gave the book to Shapham, and he read it. The word of the God is to be read. It's to be studied. It's to be memorized. We are to behold the word of God. With the assistance and the illumination of the Holy Spirit, we are to study the Bible. We need to behold the word, both the living word and the written word. As you know, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, the scripture tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Men of God need to be thoroughly furnished. And that's why we need the Word of God. Shortly uh, in, in our passage here in Deuteronomy chapter 5, this is the context when the children of Israel are about to enter the promised land. And there's a change of leadership from Moses to Joshua. And Joshua, in Joshua 1.8, the Bible says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein both day and night. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. It is important for us today to behold the Word, the written Word of God and the living Word of God. In 1 John chapter 2, verses four, verse 14, the Bible says, I have written unto you fathers, because ye have known him that was from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked. Fathers that have known God from the beginning, and young men, the word of God must abide in you. There is a generational responsibility with God, God the Son, and with our accountability to the Scripture. Each one of us has responsibility. It's not what our fathers have done, not what our mothers have done, but each of us have a responsibility to our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
600,000 men, and presumably 600,000 women, the wives of the 600,000 men, rejected God and God's direction. The people of Israel, as you remember, followed the ten. And they rejected the advice of the two. They decided to go with the 83% who was wrong, and failed to follow the 17%, Joshua and Caleb, who were right. And so God had condemned them, had punished them, those 600,000 men, those people who were 20 years and above, so 600,000 men, 600,000 women, to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until they died. One year for each day, the spies were in the land. And so they wandered, and they wandered for 40 years, making approximately 40 t- stops, pitching the tabernacle in different places. And now Moses is talking to them. They're in transitioning from the time of going from the wanderings to the victory of Jericho. And this is when Moses calls Israel to them. He has some very important things to say to Israel. And we, by application, we can learn some of these things that Moses is telling them. He wants them to learn, to keep, and to do. That is the scripture. And if we're going to learn, keep, and do, and also hear the word of God, we have to look at it. We have to behold the word of God. And we cannot behold the word of God in our own strength. First, we have to look at Christ. Behold Christ. And then, we turn to the scripture for our understanding. This is our, all we need is the scripture in life. We don't need any supplemental books, any supplemental materials. Like so many false religions have these days, we need is the word of God. Moses called all Israel and said unto, said, said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your ears this day, that ye may learn them and keep them. And Moses reminds the children of Israel about the covenant in verse 2. The covenant that was made on Sinai. And Horeb is another name for Sinai. The Lord, our God, made a covenant with us in Horeb. A covenant with us. A covenant is a promise that God had made with the children of Israel. A promise especially to them. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 16, we're reminded of the covenant at Horeb, according to all that thou desired of the Lord, thy God in Horeb, in this day, of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord thy God, neither let me see this great fire any more that I die. And we're reminded of the covenant in Horeb in Second Chronicles 5.10. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables which Moses put therein at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. And Horeb is the place where the children of Israel constructed the golden calf. It's a place where they rebelled against God. But God made a covenant with his people. God made a covenant with his chosen people there at Sinai. And in verse 3, the Bible tells us, And the Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us. Even us, who are all of us, here alive this day. He wants to remind them of, again, the individual responsibility. It was a covenant he made with them, not the previous generation, but a covenant that he made with them. Our fathers are important people, and God wants them to listen and obey him, But we have a responsibility. Each of us have an individual responsibility to behold God ourselves, to behold the scripture ourselves. 
verse 4 tells us, The Lord talked with you, meaning those that generation, face to face in the mount, in the midst of the fire. And the reference here to the fire as talking about God's glory. God's glory. Here God is talking to them, and the scripture says, face to face. There are several passages in scripture where the word face to face is used. First one we'll mention today is found in Genesis chapter 32, verse 20. Genesis 32, verse 20. And Jacob called the name of the place Penuel. For I've seen the face of for I've seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Penuel is the place where Jacob had that wrestling match with Jehovah. Because he said he saw God face to face. That's what Penuel means. It means face to face, the face of God. Jacob saw him there face to face. And here, Moses, in verse 4, is reminding the people that the Lord talked with you face to face. When we look into the perfect law of liberty, the, perfect, the scripture, God can talk to us. When we pray to God, we can talk to Him. But God wants us to fellowship with Him face to face. In Exodus 33, verse 11, the Bible says, And the Lord spake to Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. In Numbers 14, verse 14, And they will tell you to the inhabitants of the land, for they have heard that the Lord art among this people, that thou art seen face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them, and thou goest before them by day time in a pillar of cloud, and in night by a pillar of fire. So God met with the children of Israel face to face. He didn't meet with them in some abstract manner, but he met with them face to face. And God wants us to behold him. We can look into the word of God and we can see the completed canon of scripture, the completed scripture from Genesis to Revelation. We can look into the Word of God to grow, to be conformed to the image of His Son. And I stood, verse 5, and I stood between the Lord and you at the time to show you the Word of the Lord. For ye are afraid by reason of fire and went not up into the mount. Moses was going to, was going to show them the Word of the Lord. We need to behold the word of the Lord. Moses was showing the people, the children of Israel, the scripture, the word of the Lord, what God intended for them to know. It was revealed to them. We have what God wants us to know, revealed with us, for us in the scripture. There are over 36 elements of God's word. God's word should be feared. It should be feared. Exodus chapter 9, verse 20. He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the house. If someone disregards the word of God, they will suffer the consequences. And some of those in Exodus 9 did disregard God's word. And they suffer the consequences. God's word is precious. God's word is precious. 1 Samuel 3.1 And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. God's word is to be shown. Moses was showing God's word to the children of Israel. And they were beholding it. 1 Samuel 9.27 And as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us. And he passed on. But stand now still a while, that I may show thee the word of God. 
God's word should not be rejected. When Moses was showing the children of Israel the word of God, it is not to be rejected. 1 Samuel 15.23 For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he also hath rejected thee from being king. The word of God needs to be tried. Second Samuel 22.31 As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. God's word will never fail. It's been tried and it's been proven. It's a buckler. It's perfect. God's word will stand and it will not fall. 2 Kings 10.10 10. Know now that there shall fall unto earth, the earth nothing of the word of the Lord, which the Lord spake concerning the house of Ahab. For the Lord hath done that which he spake by his servant Elijah. God's word is to be heard. It is to be heard. Second Chronicles 18.18 18. And again he said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne, and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. These are some elements of the importance of the word of the Lord. It should be kept. God's word should be kept. Second Chronicles 34, verse 21. Go inquire of the Lord for me, and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah, concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all this that is written in the book. It is important for us to keep the word of the Lord. Otherwise, failure to do so results in tragedy. The word of the Lord is perfect. Psalm 19, verse 7. If you look there for a moment. Psalm 19, verse 7. The Bible says, in Psalm 19, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. God's word is perfect. And Moses was trying to communicate to the people when he was trying to show them the word of the Lord, the importance of the scripture. They didn't have the entire scripture as we do today, they had a portion of it. We have a far greater amount of scripture today than they had. God's word is right. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. God's word is pure. Every word of God is pure. He's a shield unto them that put their trust in him. God, through the mouth of Moses, was trying to encourage the people to look at the word of God. Moses was showing to the people the word of God. And the people were to respond to it. We have a responsibility to respond to God's word. God's word should be sought. In Amos chapter 8, verse 12, And they shall wander from sea to sea, from north even to the east. They shall run to and fro and seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. 
They were not able to find the word of the Lord in the days of Amos because of the hardness of their hearts, because they rejected what God had for them. But we should seek God's word each day, each week, each month. On a, throughout the day, we should be reflecting upon God's word. We should be holding his word. God's word should be spoken with boldness. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. God's word should never be abandoned. And when it is abandoned, then problems occur. We should never abandon God's word. It should always be part of us. It should always there be before us. The first place we go should be to the word of God. Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God to serve tables. The word of God is a seed. Just sharing a scripture verse with somebody. It's a seed. In Luke chapter 8 verse 11, the seed is the word of God. God's word should be testified and preached. And when Moses was talking to the children of Israel, he wanted them to affirm those things that were contained, that were found in the word of God. And then when they were testified and preached, the word of the Lord returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. God's word should be remembered. Then remembered the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. God's word should be taught. God's word should be spoken. If we recall the account in Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 16, when we have the flipping jailer, and the, the, the great earthquake, we, say, we, say, we know that it was midnight, and the foundations where the prison were shaken, and all the doors were open, prisoners' brains were loosed, and the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, drew out his sword, and would have killed himself, supposing the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for light, and sprang in, and came trembling, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And they took him the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Here we have a situation where the Philippian jailer was seconds away from death, committing suicide. But Paul cried with a loud voice. And the jailer asked the simple question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And the response was, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. Here's a jailer. Father that brought his, these men back to his house, so that his children could hear about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's word will prevail. In Acts chapter 19, verse 20, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. God's word should be handled properly. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 2, but have renounced the hidden things of God Dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. The word of God is the sword of the Spirit. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Ephesians 6, 
17. God's word should be sounded out. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad, so that we need not speak anything. God's word must be received. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when we receive the word of God which we heard of us, he received it not as the word of men, but as in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. God's word must have free course in our lives. First Thessal- Second Thessalonians 3.1 Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of God may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. God's word should not be bound. 2 Timothy 2.9 Wherein I suffer trouble, an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. God's word should not be blasphemed. God's word is powerful. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to dividing the center of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is the discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's word is the absolute standard. Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth there, and he be not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds." God's word abides forever, being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. God's word, looking to the revelation, will bring persecution for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 1.9 The Lord Jesus Christ The incarnate Son of God is called the Word of God. Revelation 19, 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. As Moses was revealing to the people in Deuteronomy chapter 5, he was showing to them the Word of God. He was revealing to him the word of the Lord. God wants us to behold the word of the Lord. Moses showed the people the word of the Lord. All these elements of God's word, Moses was showing to those people. These people had witnessed wonderful things of God's provision. Those 40 years in the wilderness. And God was providing for them. God reminds them in verse 6, I am the Lord which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Israel, rather Egypt, is a place of sorrow, a place of separation, a place of pain, a place of punishment. And yet Jehovah God He brought the children of Israel out of this place. He delivered them. He rose by the servant Moses. By his servant Moses. God delivered them. Millions of people. God brought out of that nation of Egypt. With a mighty and powerful hand. And here in verse 7. God says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. He is the only one. There are no other gods. All other gods are false. All other gods are phony. Throughout the ages of time, man has created and devised all types of false gods. Gods they craft with their own hands. Gods they invent in their mind. There is both 
material and non-material gods that man develops. And God tells us, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 7, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And here we have Moses standing before the children of Israel, telling them, reminding them, how God has brought them out of the land of Egypt. How God has promised to deliver them. How God has established this system of the tabernacle, which points all the elements of the tabernacle point to redemption that is found in the cross of Calvary. And then Moses, again, Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law, the Ten Commandments. The the following nine commandments are given. And in verse 22, the Bible says, These words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mounts, out of the midst of the fire of the cloud and of the thick darkness with a great voice and he added no more and he wrote them in two tables of stone and delivered them unto me. God gave the finger of God on tablets of stone he wrote those ten commandments. The first being Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The children of Israel were gathered along the base of Horeb or Sinai, and they saw and they heard, they smelled the fire, the burning smoke, the glory of God. And it came to pass when you heard the voice out of the midst of darkness, for the mountain did burn with fire, that ye came near unto me. And all the heads of your tribes and your elders. Verse 24. And ye said, Behold, the Lord our God hath showed us his glory and his greatness. God's glory. God depicted to them his glory, his greatness. This is what God showed to those children of Israel. And we heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God doth talk with man, and he liveth. The God of glory is the only one that liveth. All other gods are dead whether they're material or non-material, they are dead. They do not live. God depicted to them his glory. And we have to have the glimpse of God's glory. The glory of God. The Shekinah glory of God. And here, in the book of Deuteronomy, we're reminded that the children of Israel were able to see God's glory. The Shekinah glory of God. Exodus 16, 7. And and in the morning, then ye shall see the glory of the Lord. For he heareth your mornings against the Lord. And what are we that ye murmur against us? It's so important that we understand the glory of God. God's glory and God's holiness. We cannot approach God. We cannot be accepted in God's sight with our own righteousness. We need His holiness. God's glory is exceedingly undescribable. And these few verses here we're talking through, going through, reading. They will try to help us understand about God's glory. The Shekinah glory. A great brightness. A burning smoke. Fire. God's Shekinah glory. 2 Chronicles 7.3 
And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down, and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement, and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. God's glory shall cause, should, should cause us to worship and to praise God. The children of Israel, there in the mount, they saw God's glory, and they were fearful of it. Psalm 104, verse 31. The glory of the Lord shall endure forever. The Lord shall rejoice in his works. Isaiah 2.10 Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. And one, this is Isaiah 6.3 One cry to the other Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah 40, verse 5. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Ezekiel 3.23 Then I arose and went forth into the plain, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there, as the glory which I saw at the river Chabar, and it fell on my face. Hezekiah 2.14 For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. We want to be filled with with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, just as the waters cover the sea. Luke chapter 2, verse 9. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. At the Annunciation, we had the glory of the Shekinah glory that was there. Beholding the written word of God, beholding the living word of God. Second Corinthians three eighteen. But we all with open face, beholding in the glass the glory of the Lord, are changed in the same image from glory to glory, even as the Spirit of the Lord. Looking into the perfect law of liberty, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord changed into the same image. Only thing that could change us is God. God could use the Word of God to change us, to mold us, to convict us. To cause us to be those people, those fathers, those mothers, those children of His that He wants us to be. And the account in Deuteronomy chapter 5 should cause us to reflect upon the importance of God's Word and the supremacy of God's glory. For we do not have a proper placement of God's written word, and if we do not have the proper placement of God's glory, then God will not be able to work in us, work through us. God wants us to behold His Son, the His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God wants us to behold his written word. And as these children of Israel, on the brink of entering the promised land, were told by Moses, they were told 
They, they were to hear, they were told to learn, to keep, and to do as Moses had told them in verse 1 of chapter 5. And Moses called all of Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your ears this day, that you may learn them and keep and do them. And this is the challenge, this is the command, this is the imperative for us this morning, to learn, to keep, and do the word of the Lord. Father, allow us this day to be encouraged, to be edified by thy word. I want to thank Thee that Thou hast died for us upon the cross of Calvary, shedding Thine own blood, that we might be declared righteous and children of Thine because of what Christ has done. Give us the wisdom we need, the understanding that we should study the Word of God. Allow us to have that desire to embrace that which is godly, and to shun that which is evil. In Jesus' name, amen.